gospel COVID narrative, which won me many enemies in Christian, Christianity, many rebukes, how I hated the elderly and all that kind of stuff. And uh, so anyway, good to know they finally figured it out after four years that it was all messed up. <laughs> so we'll see what happens. We have welcome cards for anybody who'd like to fill one out. And... Um, you just get them back up here to the pulpit, and that'd be great. We also have tracks out on the back table over this way about St. Patrick, because it's top of the morning to everybody, right? This is St. Patrick's Day. I see somebody with a green hat on. Um, I looked in my closet, and I didn't have one green item to wear, not even a green tie. So I have nothing green. But I am part Irish. My wife's part Irish. It's the only nationality we have in common out of our many nationalities. Um, but anyways, I encourage you to get these. We make these ourselves here at Mercy Seat because so many St. Patrick Day tracks are so awful, so pathetic. So we made our own, and they're outside in the hallway, and you can feel free to grab one. I mean, grab a pile and pass them out as you go through your day today or tomorrow at work. All that kind of thing. He's a nine-year-old Patrick. He celebrated his birthday. Oh, well, congratulations. That's awesome. There you go. Broadcast his own name everywhere. <laughs> um, I think that's it. I think I got everything down. Um, I'm going to take a break from Genesis chapter... Oh, yes. Children's Church for Kids Ages 4 to 10 out in the hallway if you'd like to avail yourselves to that. If you prefer your kids stay with you, totally good. So, um, but yeah, I'm taking a break again from Genesis 3. I know at this point you're thinking, this guy's never really going to preach from Genesis 3. <laughs> and I, actually, I'm starting to think that myself. <laughs> so I'm getting a little worried. But I really felt God wanted me to preach this sermon this morning to single people. And to focus in on Patrick, um, you know, we've had many sermons here at Mercy Seat addressing marriage and family. And in fact, I did one just two weeks ago on marriage and family. And this is good, given the state of marriage and family in America. It's good that we have many sermons about marriage and family. But there's also many single people here at Mercy Seat. And there has not been nearly as much practical preaching toward that people group over the years. So this morning I want to address the single people in the church. And I'm really praying that God would use it powerfully in your heart in regards to what he would have for you for your life and what he would have for you to do. So our text is actually going to be out of the book of 1 Corinthians. So if you could turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, we're going to read verses 32 through 34. 1 Corinthians 7, 32 through 34, if you could stand for the reading of God's word, that would be good. The Apostle Paul writes, but I want you to be without care. He who is unmarried cares for the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord, but he who is married cares about the things of the world, how he may please his wife. There is a difference between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman cares about the things of the Lord, that she may be holy, both in body and in spirit. But she who is married cares about the things of the world, how she may please her husband. May God bless the reading of his word. The title of my sermon this morning is St. Patrick, a Sermon to Single People. Let's bow our heads and pray. Lord, we give thanks and we give praise to you for this time that we do have to talk about this important matter of being single. And Lord, we ask and pray that you be glorified in it, even as we look at this brother from many centuries ago in his faithful service to you. And I ask and pray, O oh God, that you would use it all to build a fire in the hearts of your people, that there would be that one or that, those some, O oh God, who, whose hearts are greatly impacted by what is declared this day, that you would use it to build a fire in their heart, to want to live their lives in service to you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. 
If you look at verses 7 through 9 here in 1 Corinthians 7, you'll see that it says this, For I wish that all men were even as I myself. Paul's talking about the fact that he was single. For I wish that all men were even as myself, but each one has his own gift from God, one in this manner and another in that. But I say to the unmarried and to the widows, it is good for them if they remain even as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, let them marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. Notice that it says here that each has his own gift. Both being married and being single are a gift. One to one manner, another to the other manner. It's a gift. So what is your gifting? To be single or to be married? Either way, Paul says here, quote, each one has his own gift from God, whether single or married. It's a gift from God. So you are not a weirdo because you're single. Your life is not over because you're single. John the Baptist was single. Paul was single. Jesus himself was single. Amen? So no, you're not weird because you're single. Even though I've met many single people who feel they're weird. Now understand, some are single and steadfastly so, as their singleness is a gift from God for them, while others are single simply because they are waiting to find a spouse and have not found him or her yet. Some are steadfastly single, and some are what I call waiting singles, waiting for the spouse to arrive. Whichever you are, what Paul has to say in verses 32 through 34, our text, where he addresses the unmarried, applies to you. Whether you're single, waiting for a spouse, or you know you're going to be single, it's what he has for you the rest of your life, verses 32 through 34 apply to you. The man who takes a wife, when we read our passage, 32 through 34, the man who takes a wife has to focus on her rather than singly on the Lord and his work. And the woman who takes a husband has to focus on him rather than singly on the Lord and his work. And these are all good things, and I've talked about them in marriage and family sermons. But that isn't the point of this sermon today. The man who takes a wife must put time into properly caring for her, and a woman who takes a man as her husband must put time into properly caring for him. Amen. And what it says here in 32 through 34 is true, because I've seen single people throughout my life who've served Christ diligently in a busy, life-fulfilling fashion, and once they get married, they do less. I've watched it all my life. Why? Because of what it says here in verses 32 through 34. You now have a duty. How you serve Christ is different now. You're married. Being single is a gift from God. Listen to me now. As it allows people increased freedom to serve God in unique and important ways. At times in ways married people cannot. Being single is a gift from God as it allows people increased freedom to serve God in unique and important ways. You have more time to focus on him and the things dear to his heart and more time to do those things. And you see people like Paul and countless men and women of God down through church history who have done amazing things for God because they were not encumbered with the duties and responsibilities of wife and children. People who had the freedom due to their singleness to serve the Lord in unique and important ways that married people would be unable to do. But many single people today are not like Paul and these other single people down through the history of Christianity. They do not pursue the Lord as to what he has for them to focus on him and use their time more fully in service to him and to exercise the freedom they have to serve the Lord in unique and important ways. They don't. Rather, they squander countless hours in their myopic, narcissistic, American Christianity lives. That's the overwhelming status of most single people. 
I believe every single person who is serious about living for the Lord has to have that time in their life where they consider remaining single. Every married person here probably had that time. I know I did. It lasted about two weeks. And I was like, yeah, no way. No way. I, I'm pursuing a woman. But every single person wrestles with this idea. Everyone does. Where they are willing to take that for the life of be the will of God, to be single. Single people can do things in service to Christ that married people just cannot. They have more time to focus on Christ and to serve him in ways that married people are restrained from doing. A single person can leave at the drop of a hat to go some distant place where ministry is needed. They can. They can hazard their lives more easily. They have no diapers to change, no faces to wipe, no bread to put on anyone's table. They have time to seek God's face and follow his leading day to day. Very different life than married people with children. Susanna Wesley, John Wesley's mother, who had 19 children, would put her apron over her head just to find a few minutes to pray with the Lord. A little different life. And all the children knew to leave her alone when the apron was over her head. But a single person can seek God for hours and then still have hours to follow through with service rendered to Christ. And this is your great gift to Christ and his body, single people. You are able to exercise the freedom you possess to serve the Lord in unique and important ways. You can serve the Lord in singleness of heart and singleness of mind. Now, I know some people think that everyone from Constantine to the Reformation went to hell, okay? But that isn't true. There were tons of people still going to heaven between Constantine and the Reformation. God has always had his remnant, and I want to proffer an example to you of both the heart and the living of a single person who loves Christ, and I give you... As an example of a single person's focus in time this morning, St. Patrick. St. Patrick. By the way, our family has a tradition. We go to the largest St. Patrick's Day parade in the state of Wisconsin, which happens to be like four miles from our house, every year, and pass out tracts and talk to people. Um, Some of the women folk will make baked goods, We'll dye our dog green, and we'll walk through there, passing out tracks, selling baked goods, too. So it's pretty cool. But we don't do it when St. Patrick's Day falls on Sunday, which is today, because they have it in the morning at 10 a.m. And it's amazing to me how many people are three sheets to the wind at 10.30 a.m. Today is St. Patrick's Day. Patrick was a man who actually lived and who actually won the people of Ireland to Christ. That little track that I showed you, it's like a great memento to people. It actually tells, we go there, we pass this out at the parade, people come up to us. I I had no idea any of this about Patrick. They just thought it was a day to get drunk. And it points men to Christ, too. So again, I encourage you to take those and hand them out. Patrick was radically evangelistic, and Patrick was single. He was single. Patrick was born in present-day Britain near the end of the 4th century, about 387 AD. We don't know for absolute surety. His father and his grandfather were both magistrates and Christian ministers or priests. This was common... This was common after Constantine. Some were true Christians, others were complete frauds who professed Christianity for financial and political gain. We have no idea which was the case for Patrick's father and grandfather, none whatsoever. One thing we do know, however, the family had money and it had means. And Patrick had no interest in serving Christ at a personal level up until he turned 16. He was in rebellion to the Lord, so he was a 16-year-old young man, completely indifferent towards Christ. 
When Patrick was 16 years old, he and his family were vacationing. Yes, people have been vacationing for a long time. Holiday, right? They were vacationing at his parents' villa on the coast when pirates from Ireland raided the home. His parents escaped, but Patrick and a few others were captured and taken to Ireland. Patrick was sold into slavery to a harsh man named Milak, the Druid. If you know anything about Druids, bad, bad, and bad. You don't want to be owned by a Druid. Soon after this, Patrick committed his life to Christ. Yes, isn't it funny how calamity, tragedy, hardship, God will use that. I remember sitting in jail, busted for arson, crying out to God as a young teenager. Yeah, those things will make you think about eternal matters, make you think of things beyond the sport of the day. The other slaves mocked Patrick for his faith or despised him for it and were openly hostile towards him because of it. They derided him by calling him holy boy. One thing man's always been good at is mocking God's people. Let's go back to Sodom and Gomorrah. They were mocking Lot way back then. Well, they mocked him. Holy boy. Patrick remained Millick's slave for six years. Then Patrick had a dream that a ship was going to take him back to Britain. He fled from Millick and made his way to the coast where he found a ship. The captain told him he could not come aboard and to leave. But before he was out of sight, he was actually leaving, the captain called him back telling him that the other shipmates requested that he come along. Talk about providential. Amen? Somehow it was put within the hearts of these other shipmates. They saw him walking away. Most of the time, I was like, who cares about that dope? You know? Nope. They wanted him to come. That's providential. That was important to his life and what Christ had for Patrick's life. Have you ever had a providential occurrence where you saw the super and seeding power of Christ involved in the lives of men? I know I have on numerous occasions. One that's really important to me is I remember when I met with the doctor to uh, get a vasectomy reversal. We had two kids, me and Clara, and I didn't want any more. I told her if we have any more, I'll either go insane or we'll be broke the rest of our life. She tried to convince me not to go along with that, but I was hard-nosed. She finally went along, and boom, met with the doctor, and what happens? He says, now, do you want this permanent, or do you want it where at least there's a chance you can undo it? And I looked at him, and I said, I want this permanent. I am never undoing this. And he stood there like this. For about 45 seconds, he stood there like this. You do know how uncomfortable it is to stand in a room with someone you don't know in abject silence for 45 seconds. And when he was finally done, he goes like this. And he says, well, I'll tell you what. I'll do it as long as you let me do it where there's at least a chance that it can be undone. And I looked at him and I said, whatever. I just want to get this done. I viewed that as completely providential. That God, <laughs> I, I don't know if that doctor ever said that to any other person his entire career, right? But he said that to me, and he, had he not said that, because you know the story, I got it reversed 10 years between our second and our third child, had nine more kids, I wouldn't have had those nine children, had it not been for that moment. This is what this was like for Patrick, that these guys were like, oh no, I'll Tell him to come on. The captain brings him back. It was a providential moment in his life. The ship ended up in France, and it took two years before Patrick made it back to his family. Think of that. Yeah, the rail system hadn't been put in yet. You can imagine the rejoicing that went on when after eight years their son and brother had returned home. Patrick soon settled back into life in Britain. He decided to go into ministry and was trained for four years in the large monastic school of St. Martin of Tours. Well-known, famous. One night he had a dream wherein a man from Ireland came and offered him a letter, asking him to return to Ireland. He saw the very men who mocked him calling for him to return. 
in this dream. They said, holy broth of a boy, we beg you, come back and walk once more among us. Patrick was never the same after that. And that's how it is when God calls you to something. It's resolute. There's a solidness and a fire in your heart. And you can do no other. It is what he's constrained you and given you to do. Patrick was never the same. He was resolute on returning to Ireland to bring the gospel to those who dwelt there. One scholar said that, quote, the memory of the pagan darkness in which they lived haunted him day and night, unquote. When this happens to you, then you will know your calling. This is a holy thing when it happens to you, and you need to heed God's calling on your life. Your heart will burn within you. You will not be able to rest till you take up what Christ has given you to do. This is massively important for each of you sitting here to understand, to each one listening to understand. Notice God was using the very bad thing that had happened to Patrick for his purposes, kind of like Joseph of old, right, in Egypt. Patrick had learned the language while in Ireland. He knew the land. He knew their customs from being a slave there for six years. His family and the church leaders did not want him to go to Ireland. If you ever read Patrick's life and what he encountered with the Christians and the church leaders over his years of ministry at Ireland, that's a complete second sermon in and of itself. Some things never change. They did not want him to go. They told him those people are not interested in God. They like their paganism. Don't you remember? Those people made you a slave. They are harsh. They even kill people by putting them in wicker balls and light them on fire. That would be the Druids. I come from a long lineage of Druids. I have no idea. <laughs> Patrick would have none of it. He was single and his heart was burdened. After a man who was sent to Ireland returned, having little effect in the country, Patrick went. And he went with a much different attitude than the other man. He went to win them to Christ. Patrick arrived in Ireland with what one scholar called a, quote, bold and courageous plan of preaching the gospel, unquote. His plan was twofold. One, go to the kings and chiefs, in other words, the government officials, and present the gospel to them. Remember the apologists of old? Always wrote their apologies to the government officials first and then to the people. This was a common practice within Christianity for the several first centuries of Christianity that you would take the gospel to the government officials and to the people. Very common. Christ's kingdom is not only for the individual, but also for nations. So his plan was one, to take it to the kings and chiefs, and two, to go where the people are and present the gospel to them. It was very common for Patrick to go to sporting events, which I've always found to be worthless places to present the gospel to people, but that's where he would go. As He would go to the gambling centers. Yes, gambling's been around for a long time too, and do open-air preaching. When I saw that his motto was, go to where the people are. I immediately thought of all the ministry we do at the university. What do I always say to people? So stand over here. When the class break comes, there'll be a flood of people. And if there's not a flood of people where you're standing, go to where the people are. Don't stand there like a buffoon, you know, when the people are 500, 400 yards away. Go to where the people are. Amen? The first place he went to the authorities ran him out of Dodge on a hot rail. Disheartening? No doubt. Yet Patrick was steadfast. The next place he went to, he met with the chief of the area, converted him and his whole family to Christ. From there he went to Tara to present the gospel to King Leary and his court. He reached Leary's court one night before Easter, wherein the Druids' law demands that no one can start a fire on that night. 
And of course, Patrick knew this because he lived amongst them for six years. Patrick knew it was unlawful to light the fire, but Patrick lit a fire anyway on a hill outside Leary's court. He did it to challenge the false religion of the land. He also did it because he knew he'd be arrested and be able to talk to the king. When Leary inquired of the Druids as to what this meant, there's a fire on this evening when it's against my law to have a fire, the Druids replied, quote, If that fire which we now see be not extinguished tonight, it will never be extinguished, but will overtop all our fires, and he that has kindled it will overturn thy kingdom. Unquote. Leary rode out to the hill, and Patrick and those with him were arrested and put in custody. Leary commanded that Patrick was to be interviewed the following morning. The next morning, Patrick and those with him approached the palace, singing a hymn praising Christ. He explained and defended the Christian faith to the king. Some of Leary's court actually converted on the spot, but Leary never did. But he did give Patrick permission to preach the gospel throughout his realm. And this is what the missionaries and churchmen always sought for. If they couldn't win the government officials to Christ, that they could at least get their permission to present the gospel to their people unmolested. This shows part two of his bold and courageous plan. Once he had won the authorities to Christ, or at least had obtained favor from them, he preached to the multitudes. Patrick, after receiving permission from Leary to preach the gospel throughout his realm, immediately went to the national games in Telten and preached to the multitudes for a full week. I remember when we went to the Olympics and were out there for a week preaching the gospel. He did open-air preaching for a week. And this is the legacy he left, a radical evangelistic legacy. He preached at racetracks, at games, at many different places of worldly indulgence, including gambling centers. Wherever large numbers of people gathered, he preached. Even he would go to areas where there was lots of traffic, you know, carts and donkeys and people walking stuff. No, not cars yet. He even went to where their idols were where people gathered for their false religion and preached there. He even went to the national idol, Krom Kruak, and destroyed it and preached the gospel as he stood among the destroyed pieces scattered on the ground. He was an iconoclast. Remember Willebrord and Boniface? Willebrord, that's how he would start his preaching amongst the Germanic peoples. Just smash stuff to ribbons. Boy, did that draw in a crowd smashing up their little gods, and then he'd preach to them. You do understand he was hazarding his life. He was risking his life doing that. Boniface wasn't into that as much, but he was schooled under Willebrord, and scholars believe that's why he chopped down the Oak of Thor. It was because of his mentor, Willebrord, and how he would go into areas to present the gospel. Boniface chopped down the Oak of Thor, and thousands were won to Christ. Amen? So here we see Patrick was also an iconoclast. Basil of Caesarea. Remember he tore down the infanticide wall with deacons from his church? He was an iconoclast. A place of murder, bloodshed, and death. Patrick won thousands to Christ. He was tireless. He was single. He was single. He had the focus and the time to devote every ounce of his energy into these efforts. He had no noses to wipe, no diapers to change, no table for which he had to provide bread. He could steadfastly devote his life in service to Christ and his work in the earth. He hazarded his life. Many times he was physically attacked. They tried to poison him at one point. One time his chariot driver was killed because they thought he was Patrick, but Patrick and he had exchanged places. The driver was killed. Patrick lived. He hazarded his life. Yet if he died, none would be left abandoned or uncared for. He had no wife, no children. His life was in Christ's hands, and he lived his days in service to him. Amen. 
I have one son who's still single out of the five sons birthed to me and Clara, and he actually has a Gaelic name, an Irish name. Trelick is his name. You know him as Trey, Trelick. I don't know if I've ever shared from the pulpit the story of how he got his name. I don't remember ever doing it, but I'll do it now. And if you heard it before, oh well. <laughs> so. In 1997, I went over to Ireland, the Republic, which is overwhelmingly Catholic. I spent more time in that two-week trip talking about my Christian faith than probably anything I've ever traveled to in my life, because I was like a novelty. In fact, all of us who went were. Katie was there, too. Like, wow, Protestants. <laughs> We went into many houses where a Protestant had never crossed the threshold. So we went to this one house, and there was really one big dude named Patty. I know it sounds too stereotypical, but his name was Patty. And I was literally, and I'm not a big guy, we all know that, but I was literally looking at the middle of his chest. So I'm straining my neck to talk to him like this. And um, he grabs a little kid that was going by, and he pulls him up, he's about two years old, and he goes, this is my, my youngest son. I go, oh, cool. And he goes, do you know what his name is? And I said, no, and he goes, Trollock. <laughs> and I go, Trollock? I said, well, that's a cool name. I said, what does it mean? And he goes, Battle King. So I'm like, that's cool, <laughs> Battle King. I'm like all into military motif, right? <laughs> so I was like, I like that. And um, as we stood there talking, um, I asked him, do you guys homeschool over here in Ireland? He goes, oh, about three years ago, people started homeschooling. And, um, but my kids go to the, the school, the government school. And he goes, is homeschooling big in America? And I said, not as big as it should be. But there's a significant number of people, maybe 10%, um, school their children at home. And... Um, he goes, well, why do you homeschool? And I said, well, we believe that we have a duty in the sight of Christ to educate our children ourselves and not to send them off to the state. Um, our government is very wicked. And I said, but a lot of people, the reason they homeschool is because they don't want their kids taught um, sex education. And um, he looks at me and he says, oh, let me tell you. <laughs> About four years ago, the man from the government came here. And he had a meeting with all us parents. And during, and it was about sex education. And he goes, and during the intermission, I loved how he used that word, intermission. It means there's a break in the meeting. During the intermission, me and some of the lads invited him into the back room. <laughs> and we politely informed him that if he ever talked about this subject again, we'd smash his kneecaps with a hammer. <laughs> and then he looks at me with a little twinkle in his eye and he says, funny thing is, the subject's never come up since. <laughs> and as I stood there, I said to myself, my next son's named Trelick. <laughs> it was so refreshing just to hear a man talk like a man. So yes, this is a great distinction of single Christians, focus in time and freedom of opportunity. They can serve the Lord without distraction. Single Christians and the service they render for Christ is so needed in the earth in this hour. And if you are single, you need to ponder before the Lord, what do you want me to do? Even if you're a single and waiting, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to spend my days? Your face low to the ground. This was common when I was a young man in Christ, to gather and cry out to God, be in your home, at your prayer closet, cry out to God, what do you want me to do with my life now? And for the last nearly 40 years now, it all changed to go to college, get a degree, make good money. And I cry out to you today, any who are single, and I say to you, you need to seek God. What do you want me to do with my life? How do you want me to spend my days? How do you want me to spend my time? 
What do you have for me? And it may be to go to the university. It may be to start a business, but it may be something else too, right? He could be sending you off to some place where the gospel has not yet been declared, where they have not the word of God in their language. Many Christians who are single in our day squander their days in self-centered pursuits. Most do far less than even those married with children. Listen to the devotion of Patrick. I want to read to you what he penned. Quote, I came to the Irish tribes to preach the gospel and to endure insults from unbelievers, that I should hear abuse for being a foreigner, that I should endure many persecutions, even unto imprisonment, and that I should give up my liberty for the benefit of others. And if I were worthy, I am ready even to expend my life for his name, and I desire to spend it even unto death, because I am a debtor to God who gave me so much grace. These are the types of things that inspire us when we see brothers and sisters who faithfully live for him, that put a fire in our heart to want our days to count, to put the strength of our youth into energies that matter, things regarding his kingdom. Amen? Patrick's contemporaries and scholars repeatedly talk about how Patrick cared nothing for riches and honor. You know how big riches and honor are in our culture, right? It's like it's how you mark yourself out as to what value you do or don't have. He could have cared a less. He had that fire in his heart. These people needed Christ. He didn't have car payments. He didn't have a mortgage. He didn't have to provide clothes and food for a family. He didn't have stocks and bonds or a vacation home in the Porcupine Mountains. He just wanted to serve Christ and make him known. And the legacy he established lived on for hundreds of years after he died. The Gaelic Church was the most evangelistic of all churches. Their, rep- their repudiation of riches was renowned. They did not join and come under the dominion of Roman Catholicism until more than 200 years after Patrick died. It was said of his followers, quote, they were wholly indifferent to bodily comfort or to worldly advancement. They traversed the country on foot and endured without flinching privations and dangers of every kind for the one object of their lives, to spread the gospel and civilization to their rude countrymen, unquote. Would to God it could be said of us. Amen? Would to God it could be said of you. Amen. They spread the gospel to France, Germany, Italy, and other places. They preserved so much history that would have been lost there in Ireland. Whether you know you will always be single or single while waiting for your spouse, this is your greatest asset. This is your greatest gift to the Christ and to his body, single people. You are able to exercise the freedom you possess to serve the Lord in unique and important ways. You can serve the Lord in singleness of heart and mind. Amen. This is the great distinction of the single Christian, focus and time. You can serve the Lord without distraction unhindered by the many cares of the world that married people have. You can serve the Lord in unique and important ways. You can serve the Lord in singleness of heart and mind. And yet, so many single Christians squander the purpose of their singleness. So I beseech you, bless the body of Christ. Serve him with all that is in you. Serve him. May Christ be praised. Let's stand up and we'll close in a word of prayer. Father, we give thanks and praise to you for this time that we've had to consider the life of this brother. And we only skimmed the surface, Lord. But Lord, I ask and pray that you would take what was declared here today and use it for good in the lives of men to light a fire, to kindle it further. Whatever the case may be, O oh Lord, 
Lord, may we understand our lives are short, that our time is like a blade of grass. So may we live our lives in service to you. Whatever our gift is, whether married or single, may we live for you, O oh God. May we do right by you. Lord, I just ask and pray that as you work in the hearts and minds of those here gathered and listening, O oh Lord, and you build that fire within them, that they see your clear direction, that they see your hand. Lord, that they taste things regarding you they never tasted before. That they would be used mightily by you in the days ahead. That they would be like so many of the saints of old, willing to hazard their lives to the glory of your name, O oh God. We look to you for these things, Father, as only you can give them. For you are the vine and we are the branches and we can do nothing without you. We look to you, Father. Do it by the power of your Holy Spirit, we ask. We beseech you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise his name. You could be seated. And we are going to have communion this morning. And you can feel free to take communion with us as long as you're a Christian. If you're not a Christian, we ask that you not take communion as the Lord's table is only for believers to observe. But if you're a Christian, you can feel free to partake with us as we have an open table here at Mercy Seat to all believers. Amen. Praise his holy name. Praise his holy name. The Apostle Paul wrote of the Lord's table in 1 Corinthians 11. And he said, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And then the apostle says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. His body was broken. His Blood was shed at Calvary. He was the sin offering for man. We should have been put to death for our sins, the scriptures teach in Romans chapter 6. But God in his mercy sent his son to die in our stead. So that if we'll believe in him, God forgives us of our sin and we're able to have right standing with God and meet with him. Have fellowship with him, communion with him. Amen. And so we live our lives in service to him who died in our stead. And we make him known to men. May we all make him known to men. Let's pray. Lord, we thank and praise you for this time at your table. And we just ask and pray that we think well on this great salvation. How we were once in rebellion to you, shaking our fist in the air, blindly groping along the wall in a dark hallway. Lord, and by the power of your Spirit, you translate us out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, to the kingdom of your Son. And Lord, we thank you for these things. And we ask and pray that we would be faithful to you now with the days you've allotted us and make you known to men wherever we go. Use these simple tracks that we've constructed, O oh Lord, regarding St. Patrick. May your Holy Spirit work within the hearts and minds of those who get them. May they have a hunger to pursue you after reading what they say. Lord, we thank you for your goodness to us and ask that you be glorified now. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hallelujah. Praise his name. Why don't we just stand and we'll um, worship him and then close in prayer. Blessed is your name, O Lord. All praise and honor unto you, O God. We give thanks to you, Lord. Worthy is your holy name. All glory and honor to you. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. 
Father, I ask and pray now that you would bless each one here. Keep their heart hungry for you, desirous to seek your face. Lord, I pray for each man. I ask that he would be a priest to his home, that he would open your word to his wife and to his children, that they would talk about the things of you and their house, oh God. Lord, we pray for each woman that she would be a nurturer, a helper to her husband, an anchor in the home, oh Lord. May each child be a blessing to their parents. May they be desirous to seek you, O oh God, and to live their lives in service to you, to not squander them, but to use them purposefully. Lord, I just ask and pray that you continue to be glorified through each one here, and that we make you known to men that we declare your law, your word, and your gospel to the men of this nation and to the governments of men. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. May Christ be praised.